Carl, thank you so much. That was an, uh, an incredible uh, uh, introduction. It's all lies. Uh, uh, don't do any of those things. Um, so it's been a great day. I'm really grateful to Carl. I'm grateful to Cascade. I'm grateful to all of the speakers who came before. All of you who have been so optimistic and, and suggesting that if you, you know, if you just really kind of work hard and use Cascade software and pay attention to your strategy, that somehow you can get your arms wrapped around it and things are going to be okay. I'm here to change all of that. Uh, so we have uh, an extraordinary change that's coming upon us, which is hard to believe given how much change that we've already had. So this is a great quote to sort of start, which is something that Winston Churchill said at a key moment in World War II. He said, now this is not the end, it's not even the beginning of the end, but it is perhaps the end of the beginning. And, and it was an important moment. And it's relative, relevant here because in addition to it being true of World War II, after he said that, they still had a war to fight for a good long time. We're at the beginning of the digital revolution that is transforming so many aspects of our lives. And it's gone from transforming media and now it's moving out to transform a lot of other things. When it comes to strategy, a much less highfalutin way of saying this is you don't want to be this guy. For those of you who remember 30 Rock, there's this character named Dennis Duffy who was the beeper king. He sold more beepers in New York City than anyone else in 2006. And the problem is 2006, people were already using mobile phones. They didn't need beepers anymore. You don't want to fight last year's war. And 2006 is actually a very interesting date for this joke to have happened on television because the very next year was the year of the iPhone when we had another revolution and suddenly conventional feature phones started to attenuate in a big, big way. Here's another way of looking at the same phenomenon. This is good to gone, great to gone in one generation. This is the elephant's graveyard of formerly unassailable corporations. Digital equipment, they worried about IBM, but they really should have worried about Microsoft. If you think about Sears, they, sh they were worried about JCPenney. They should have worried about Costco. Kodak was worried about Fuji. They should have been worried about digital cameras and later smartphones. That is what brings us to the title, which I changed, which is Dodging Meteor Strikes. We, we have a bunch of things that are changing, colliding trends that are happening right now, and they're going to change more than you can imagine. So we're going to talk about just some of them. Uh, as Carl said, I split my time between Big Digital Idea and the center, where we do longitudinal social science about the impact of technology and behavior. Now, technology and behavior, that where technology meets behavior is a little abstract, but we can make it concrete. This is one of my favorite pictures. This is a, my favorite picture of children who aren't my children. And the reason it's my favorite picture is that the story really tells itself. You have these two people with their mitts on a member of the you know, desired uh, sex, probably for the first time in their lives. They look like they're in middle school. They're sharing this moment with each other and also with all of their friends because they're texting over each other's shoulders. Behavior is very hard to eradicate or create, but it's easy to pour from one container into another container. And by the way, the adolescent focus on mobile phones did not start with the cell phone. If you look carefully, I believe those are both Motorola razors that they're holding on to. So we adapt incredibly quickly, but then we forget that we've adapted. We have adapt amnesia. And this is a big thing to pay attention to. You know about that you know you're experiencing adapt amnesia at those moments where you have uh, your smartphone and you suddenly go from a 4G environment back into a 1G environment. When you, if you have ever early days, if you had a broadband connection that you just got and then you had to go back onto dial-up, and that feeling of you want to put a gun in your mouth and pull the trigger, it's so slow, and yet just a few weeks before that was miraculously fast. This is one of the most important quotes I think there is. It's from Bill Gates from 1996. He says, we'll always overestimate the change that will occur in the next two years and underestimate the change that will occur in the next 10. Don't let yourself be lulled into an action. It's hard to create kind of Michael Porter-esque strategic advantage in times that are so turbulent. I mean, and you have an indication of this on the cover of the book because it says, with an interactive CD-ROM. 
The book itself was, was out of date uh, technologically, although the codex, the printed book, is still very much alive. But what book comes with a CD-ROM today? There are two futures. Right? There's the Starfleet, Star Trek future where there's no money and everything's okay and you can get a latte out of a replicator. And then there's the Terminator Skynet future where the machines are coming to get us. And they're both true. That's the thing that's important. They're both true and they're both true at the same time. So in other words, with every change, we have both the joy of opportunity and the oy of having to pivot around something that's changing that you may not expect is gonna change. So what are we talking about today? We're talking about just some of the key technology and behavioral trends. We're gonna ask, are these things strategy kryptonite? Right? If you have your strategy built around television and suddenly television is largely evaporating or at least fragmenting, what does that do to your company? We have talk about the big vision of the future. We'll also talk about the future that's already here. The way you can see the seeds of what's coming and phenomena that are happening today. And we'll also give you a few things that you can do today, things you can try in order to engage with what's coming. Here's the first trend. 5G, someone mentioned this already. 5G is the new electricity. It is taking things that were not connected to the internet and it's connecting them at scale. This is a, a representation of that it's not incrementally faster. It's an order of magnitude faster. It's not going from 4G to 5G is going from 10 gigabytes per second to 10, from, pardon me, from 1 to 10 gigabytes per second. That is a huge difference. It's as big a difference as going from dial-up to broadband. For those of you who are old enough to remember this, again, that's that phenomenon, that incredible feeling of being, being online for the first time, and then the even more incredible feeling of being online effortlessly and instantaneously. In our work at the center, we've discovered that people uh, cared actually more about the instant on and the wireless home networks than they cared about the speed. When people were on dial-up, if they forgot to do something when they were on dial-up and they had to dial back up, it really pissed them off. Whereas once they have broadband, that instant on was a much bigger deal. So in addition to the speed, it's also the scope that's important. Right now we have about 5 billion connected devices uh, as of a couple of years ago. By 2020, that's next year, they're expecting to have 50 billion connected devices. And the kinds of devices, if you look at the graphic, are much different. Everything's connected. It's not just your tablet and your phone and your computer. It's your watch, which some people is already connected. It's your shoes. It's your belt buckle. It's the, something in your pantry that's measuring what you have in your, in there to eat. And the other thing that's important is that more data is going to be created in the future than now. And we are already making more data in a couple of days than we made in the entire history of the human species up until about 1950. Right? This is a graphic of what gets made in one day. You know, 4.5 million YouTube videos watched, 2.1 million snaps taken in a minute. I'm sorry, not in a day, in a minute. We have almost 700,000 hours of Netflix watched in a minute. It's going to go 10 times faster. 10 times more when we have the 5G universe. Now, some people talk about this as the Internet of Things, but the problem with the Internet of Things is that it really focuses on the things. It doesn't focus on us. What's important is our experience of the things. So I prefer to talk in the big vision of the future about connected experiences. And another way of thinking about this where it gets relevant, I think, for the people in this room, is everything becomes a service, or E-A-A-S. Everything is a service. Another way of thinking about this is a continuous activity awareness. If you can be with 5G and with monitoring software and with data and big data, you can be aware of things on a continual basis. If you're a retail store, you can have total inventory awareness. If you are running a corporation, you can be aware of everything that's happening, which we've been talking about all day. But it does mean that when it comes to planning and strategy, you move from inflection point strategy, from having a meeting on a monthly basis, on a quarterly basis, or God save you, on a yearly basis, to being continually aware of how things are going. And the requirement of being nimble, of being able to pivot around things very, very quickly if you're paying attention. And now you have no excuse not to be paying attention because you have all of that information. I don't like the phrase the Internet of Things, but the Industrial Internet of Things is quite brilliant and interesting. What GE is doing 
is they're putting a service layer on locomotives and jet engines so that you're not just buying the jet engine, you're then buying the data that gets thrown off of the jet engine so that you, GE is able to tell you, hey, you, it's time for this thing to be in for maintenance. Hey, there's a problem with this. Hey, this thing is not optimized to, you know, at its highest level. They do that with locomotives. This is going to be possible for a lot more products than big things that are sold by General Electric. It's already here. This is the future that's already here. Uh, Under Armour has their new hover running shoes, which has all of the sensors of a Fitbit, of a, fit, you know, of a fitness band built into the shoe. So that's, by the way, bad news for the Fitbit people, um, good news for runners who don't want to run with their phone, and it's an even more nuanced kind of data if you're a runner it has more information about your gait, about you know, how quickly you're going. It's not that crazily extrapolated information about the number of steps that you get from a Fitbit or a Jawbone or, or from your phone. One implication, just to sort of wrap your heads around it, is with 5G, every store can become the Apple Store or the Amazon Go Store. You don't, you no longer, if you have everything connected as you have in the Apple Store, where you can ask a question, you can transact, you can walk out, and you never have to wait in line. Well, you have to wait for somebody to show up, but you don't have to wait in that check, checkout line. That can now happen with every store. The checkout choke point goes away. So, things to do today. Ask yourself, what is your product's service layer? If you have a physical product, how would you turn it into a service? And the other thing is, go look at your choke points, whether it's checkout of an online store, whether it's a physical store, where do people get hung up in their process through doing something with you or your organization? And what happens if you eliminate those choke points? So there's another aspect of 5G that I want to talk about, which brings us to trend number two, which is the videoverse, the proliferation of screens and video everywhere. So we have a threat to cable and satellite. If you have a connection in your pocket that is 10 times powerful than the connection you have now, then suddenly you may not be able to have to subscribe to satellite or cable. You can sit in your bedroom, in your living room, and you can beam Netflix, you can beam Hulu or Amazon Prime Video On Demand, or ESPN or Disney Plus with their new services directly onto the big screen in your living room. That's the first credible threat that we've had to Comcast in a long time. We have had the cable cutting threat that's been growing incrementally, but now we have a, an, an internet connection threat. We have a bandwidth threat, and that's a very big deal. There's a thing called ATSC 3.0, which is advanced television. It is currently in testing in Arizona. It's a revival of broadcast. It turns a broadcast network in your neighborhood from one kind of crappy signal to four HD signals that are going continuously. So your ABC affiliate can now be beaming out four different channels free over the air, there's a decoder box on top of your television. Right? That's another threat to Comcast. Suddenly, why am I paying for all of these? I only watch 16 channels. If I'm getting 24 channels from the six broadcast entities that are in my town, why do I need to pay for satellite? Why do I need to pay for cable? We're seeing an explosion of over-the-top or streaming services, which, by the way, I think is a huge threat to Netflix. You know, if you, the, the journal last week, I had a thing where most of what people watch on Netflix are old TV shows, and that their original content, although it drives people to subscribe, people don't actually watch it. So then we have a proliferation of other services that are more highly niche. And I think this is going to be bad news for, uh, for, for uh, Netflix. And uh, you know, we might have had, we might be at peak TV in terms of the quality of television that's out there, but not in terms of the impact that any individual show has even Game of Thrones. So we've had fragmentation of reputation and attention. And there's some really good evidence for this. This is from, by Matthew Ball. I don't really like putting charts because it's like, it looks like a, you know, some spaghetti threw up on the screen. But, but what's really important is to see that with the exception of senior citizens, we've seen really impressive decline in television watching. This is broadcast and cable, live and DVR for three days. And look, at the, 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 the plummeting of the 18 to 24s and the 24 to 34s. Right? Television, traditional conventional linear television, is dying quickly. So the big vision of the future is that we're going to have screenotopia, more screens of all kinds, where media is fragmenting and fragmenting again. We're, we're looking at video beyond advertising. If you're a marketer, if you're a content creator, if you're a publisher, 
mark, that video is moving from advertising into utility, which I'll talk about in a minute. Now, the other big deal with the future of video is heads-up display, which is a catch-all term for smart glasses, which is virtual reality, where basically you're sticking your head into a paper bag, and you're, you, know, you don't see the world around you. Augmented reality, where it's like Google Glass, and you don't look like a cyborg, but you can see an information layer put on top of everything around you. Mixed reality is more industrial when you're manipulating that information. So this is the next first screen. The first first screen was the television, then it moved to the computer, the computer supplanted the television, then we had the phone, which is the first screen, we have movies in there somewhere, but if you're wearing a screen on your face, and it's actually controlling what you see electively, but it's giving you a lot of information, and you're no longer looking, walking around like this, where you're going to bonk into somebody else, that becomes the first screen. And the implication of that, by the way, is that mobility is not going anywhere. But the smartphone, as the first screen, is going to start to decay. So we're not going to be looking at smartphones. What we'll have is a screen on our face and a processor in our pocket. And that is another huge change. So if you've built your company around smartphones, then you should probably rethink that decision. Uh, one of uh, Oculus Quest is coming out next month. It's a $400 headset. And uh, there are two terrifying things about Oculus Quest. The first is that uh, Facebook owns it. Right? They already know everything that you post and everything that you read. Now they're going to know everything that you watch and everything that you play. And of course, we've seen how trustworthy Mark Zuckerberg is with all of our information. Um, the other terrifying thing about Oculus Quest, which is true also of Oculus Go, is that it comes with Netflix built in. So we already have this extraordinary environment where we can watch movies in, in, with these glasses. Well, that may not sound scary to you, but it probably is pretty scary if you're a television manufacturer, because this is the viewing environment for watching Netflix in Oculus. And that's kind of nice, right? That's like a chalet on top of a mountain. That's nicer than my place. And yet, so you can watch, you can watch your movies, basically you're wearing an IMAX screen on your face. And that's a pretty alluring way of watching a movie. Now, there are a couple of flaws with this. One is that co-viewing is still a big deal. Right? It's important to watch things with other people. We already have with Oculus, there is a virtual co-viewing opportunity where my avatar can beam into a theater and my wife's avatar can beam into a theater and we can virtually watch things together. Right? And so that's pretty unsatisfying, but it's going to get better. It's particularly going to get better uh, with, uh, you know, with augmented reality. And so, but I think it's really bad news for any household in this country to have more than one television. And I think that the age, the age has already been attenuating because, you know, if you look at, whoops, sorry, beep, if you look at youngsters today, you know, they're mostly watching videos on their computers and their phones. But just 20 years ago, there were TVs scattered throughout the, uh, throughout the house. That's not going to be the case anymore because in addition to the computers and the phones, now we have the glasses. So if you're like me, go to CES every couple of years, start to watch for the tumbleweeds to be blowing through the Sony and the Samsung exhibits because the televisions are no longer going to be as popular. And then, but we're just talking right now about ordinary video entertainment. There are lots of different competition. Uh, DJ Marshmallow did a concert in Fortnite. And, and it's like, it's the stupidest thing that I can possibly imagine, right? I'm like, really? And people came to this thing? And avatars were undulating, you know, and dancing as people were playing this game? Yes, in fact, 10 million concurrent users came to that concert. So your next big video hit might be inside of Fortnite. Isn't that astonishing? And by the way, it's not just massive hits. Here's something that happened yesterday. Yesterday, my son, who's 13, who rose, he was in a regatta in British Columbia. We couldn't go. It was a four-day thing. But we discovered that it was on friggin' YouTube in HD. And I have a Roku box. So I got an HD live streaming version of my son's regatta on my te living room television as he was doing it. And I'm cheering along, and my wife's cheering along, and my daughter's there, and we're texting the grandparents, and people are watching this. So you don't only have big media, you have extraordinarily niche media. 
Kevin Kelly talks about a thousand true fans. Right? You have the ability to super serve a smaller audience using this technology. And by the way, you also have other kinds of things happening. Physical constraints go. Adobe just three weeks ago uh, gave a test of this at their CMO summit about using uh, AR to put yourself into a shopping environment or to digitize the, go the goods and put it into your home. Uh, and you can see this already, the future that's already here. You can try on glasses with an iPhone app from Warby Parker. So you can try on lots and lots of different things. And you can do it instantaneously. It's frictionless. And it saves Warby Parker a ton of money on shipping you 75 different frames and having to pay for all of that. Now you can, you can have your consideration set narrowed possibly down to one. Never, they never have to ship anything. And you never leave your couch. So things to do today. Ask yourself, how do you compete with easier experiences? This is straight Clay Christensen stuff, right? Something that's easier, that's, uh, that's you know, cheaper. How do you compete with that? If someone's coming up with something that has half of your capabilities, but it's a quarter of the price, how are you going to compete? And then go buy an Oculus headset. Right, go buy it. There's one that you can get the Go for $300. You'll get the Quest for $400. Stick your head in this thing and see what the future of entertainment is going to be. And remember that augmented reality is going to be infinitely bigger than virtual reality. The, the third trend is self-driving cars, which go so far beyond transportation. That's one of the things that's important to me. I lead the Future of Transportation project at the center. We did a big, big deep dive into transportation. We found some extraordinary things. For example, year over year, in 2016, if you look, you see, this is the answer to the question, if you called an Uber or a taxi and it rolled up to the curb and it was driven by nobody, what would you do? And what we see is that, well, in one sample, it was 11% of Americans would just get in. But here what we're seeing is, you know, 18 to 24, it's about the same. We're seeing a really curious decline for 55 to 64. But look at 25 to 34, 35 to 44, 45 to 54, even the seniors. Right? This is a fantasy, because it's not really available except in Phoenix. This is a fantasy that's a very powerful one for Americans. It shows there's immense liquidity in how people think about transportation. Now, one of the things that I care a lot about are what we call second order consequences to these things. So for example, this is a chart about different services that people could get in self-driving cars. And the, ones on the, the two on the far right are the ones I want you to pay attention to. 25% of Americans, actually I think it was 27% of Americans, said that they would go to a, see a first-run movie in a vehicle. That's not a drive-in theater, that's a drive-around theater. But even more interestingly, that 27% of Americans would, do, would, would choose to sleep in a car with a comfortable bed, and presumably with chocolate on the pillow and a duvet, instead of going to a hotel. So if you were going from here, say, to, I don't know, Vancouver, British Columbia, that's a pretty long drive. But instead of flying and having to deal with TSA and, uh, and getting it through security and then securing a, a hotel, you know, car comes up at 11 o'clock, you kiss your wife, your husband, you get in the car, you go to sleep, you have to pee, you say, I've got to pee, you press the little button, it finds a rest area for you. You wake up the next morning and you're at your destination. There's a refreshment center where you can change clothes, maybe shower. This has got some pretty profound implications for the hospitality industry. The Marriott people should be paying attention to this. It's either an obstacle or an opportunity, right? Because somebody's got to run those fleets, and somebody's got to have that, that refreshment center. But if they just have their heads in the stand, then they're going to start seeing a lot of business go away. This is a close-up on age, 18 to 24 and 25 to 34. Those people do rent hotel rooms, and they are much more likely to choose a self-driving car with a bed than people who are much older. This is Larry Burns' book. Uh, it's a really brilliant book that I recommend. The size of the transformation in our uh, is, is immense. Today, Americans, I know many of you came from outside America. I hope to God that you're paying less per mile than we are. Today, Americans spend about a buck fifty a mile. With the self-driving revolution, that's going to drop to 20 cents a mile. Right? That's an immense savings. That's four trillion dollars a year. That's the US federal budget. And we see a lot of important things happen immediately. We see that shopping and face-to-face -face meetings suddenly become easier. The hassle of getting to places goes away. Parking goes away. Costs for delivery nosedive. 
We're already seeing this with some robot delivery, which is really weird. I mean, can you can imagine, it's like the size of a German Shepherd. Like, who has the right of way when this thing's driving up to your house? But we also are seeing some second order consequences that are really interesting. So the big vision of the future here is we have some tweaked shopping models. Shopping, meetings, live theater, restaurants. Today, customers drive to places where they shop, and then they get stuff. That's the, I'm sorry, that's yesterday. That's the analog era. Today, with the e-commerce era, people shop at home. Stuff gets sent to them at their home or their office. With autonomous, customers are, get driven to places. Businesses subsidize the transportation where they shop and get stuff, and then they get driven home. And so for the first time, we have a credible threat to Amazon. Because with, in this world, in-store shopping is suddenly as easy as e-commerce. That is a huge deal. There aren't a lot of vulnerabilities that Amazon has. And by the way, they have Whole Foods, so it's not that big a one. But it suddenly gives the mom and pop store a, a fighting chance. Because if I can pay a dollar and send a self-driving car to get somebody five miles away, and they come, in, come, come into my store, and they shop and spend money, and then I spend another dollar to send them home, that's going to incentivize them to come to the store where they can feel the fabric, they can you know, touch the produce, rather than just order it online. Uh, and this is also new kinds of business promotion. Waymo is already talking about this. They're talking about you know, businesses, well, I'll pay Waymo to bring you to the mall or the destination of the hotel. Right? So subsidized, commercial, tr subsidized transportation to commerce is a big deal. And the big question is, when are self-driving cars coming? How soon? Well, these companies think that it's going to be 2020. That's next year. I think that they're a little bit optimistic. It'll be, it'll be in places in 2020. It's not going to be widespread by then. Last week, Elon Musk had what I can only describe as a psychotic episode when he said that there would be a million Tesla robo-taxis wandering around the country. Uh, he has a, a history of uh, over-promising and under-delivering, um, and I think this is one example of that. Now, the future that's already here we can see this with uh, one of my two favorite startups in the country right now called Freebird Rides. And what Freebird does is it uses Uber and Lyft and it works with restaurants and bars. So if Murphy's Pub has a crappy Thursday night, Murphy contracts with Freebird, gives them 500 bucks, that's gonna be 50 $10 Uber rides. People tend to bring two friends. So for a $10 Uber ride, you get two, actually 2.7 people, I don't know what the, where, how much the 0.7 person drinks, that come into the bar, they're gonna spend a lot more than $10. It's also the most efficient advertising in the world because Murphy only pays for the people who take the rides. So that means we have another tweaked model, and I'm sort of running out of time. Um, from places to people. So we had analog, we had e-commerce, we had autonomous, where people are gonna be driven to places, but now we have dynamic shopping, where customers are in motion, they're shopping in the car. We do that with our phones already, but then we'll have real-time in-car delivery. So you're going somewhere and that drone with the latte that's been a fantasy, this is actually much more likely. So today we have drive through, near, sometime soon we're going to have drive near or drive past, where you no longer wait in line at McDonald's, you drive past McDonald's and a little robot on a unicycle comes up and hands you their Big Mac through the, mirror, the, through the window. You're not driving, the car's driving you, so you eat your lunch on your way to your meeting. Things to do today. Ask yourself, what if transportation to my business is free for my consumer? And then experiment with ride hailing. Right now, Uber and Lyft are massively subsidized. Use those subsidies to your advantage before either of those companies go away, which they're both likely to do. So I'm going to do one more trend, because we've talked a lot about artificial intelligence. So at the end, I'm going to talk about artificial intelligence very briefly. But this is the, this is the fourth trend, which is 3D printing. I call this the last 10%. So the last 10%, we're talking about a new form of fabrication. This is the traditional supply chain for Adidas. It takes uh, four months between inspiration and somebody perspiring as they run in an Adidas shoe. With the speed factory, which is a new thing they're doing in different markets, suddenly that goes down to days or weeks. It moves fabrication closer to the point of consumption using a combination of different fabrication methods, including 3D printing. Now, 3D printing right now is primarily only used for prototyping, but in the very near future, we're going to ask the question Gordon Moore asked, you know, does Gordon Moore's law apply here? Are the capabilities going to become, going to double every 18 months? And what happens when that's the case? 
And what happens is that we go from enterprise talking about consumers, well, not, they're no longer consumers because they're helping to make things, right? Well, not really customers because, again, they're also helping to design and fabricate. You've got makers, it's close, but really I think co-creators is what we're talking about. This is the last 10%. The enterprise is going to create the first 90% of a product. The co-creator is going to create the last 10% of it. And suddenly, we're going to start seeing uh, a lot of exciting new things with products and brands. And this is not this kind of activity, the energy to do this sort of thing. It's not just crazy people from the Society of Creative Anachronism. It's not just Civil War reenactors. It's the maker movement. Right? There's a huge maker movement in this country and in, in, uh, and in other countries. They, uh, more than a million people a year go to maker fairs. These aren't weirdos. These are early adopters. Right? The peop everyone is going to be doing this. And maker fairs are huge, huge events where people are doing lots and lots of exciting things. So the way to think about this is for all physical products are going to become like Build-A-Bear, right? the Build-A-Bear workshop. That suddenly, rather than just buying things, ordering things, and having them delivered to you, you're going to be engaging with the design and creation of the products that you use on a daily basis. Whether it's clothing, whether it's foodstuffs, whether it's furniture, uh, the, it, we, suddenly your activity level is going to be as much as you want it to be. Retail is going to be much more like a Sephora store, where people go and they are consulting with experts. Brands transmogrify from national and mass to local and tribal. Right? So suddenly, the Nike shoes that you're wearing here, because you've finalized them, you've taken care of that last 10%, <coughs> are going to look a lot different than the Nike shoes in Kentucky. And different companies are going to be able to sample <coughs> pardon me, different kinds of materials. So things to do today. Ask yourself, are the people who give you their money consumers? Are they customers? Are they co-creators? Or are they something else? And then go pick up a copy of Make Magazine. It's like 15 bucks, and you're going to see the level of passion and engagement that people have with this kind of activity. It's important, and it's coming. Now, the last trend is AI. We've been talking about a lot, and I'm out of time. So I'm going to go and skip to what I think is the most important point that I have, which is uh, that the AI apocalypse is upon us. And the thing that's important is for us to understand that algorithms are different than people. And, the, and AI is not coming to replace us. It's coming to augment us. Clive Thompson has this term called a centaur, which is the teaming up of a human and an AI. Data amplifies human-to-human -human relationships. Now, the thing that's important, particularly for, from a strategic perspective, which is why I'm skipping to this part, is to think about what AIs are good at and what humans are good at. So AIs are good at recognizing things. Humans are good at noticing things. AIs are good at explicit knowledge. Humans are good at tacit knowledge, tacit knowledge that we can actually do more things than we can explain. Right? We can recognize someone without telling, explaining how we recognize that person. We can ride a bike without really explaining how we, how we ride a bike. AIs are good at pattern recognition. Humans are good at pattern creation. AIs are good at categorizing things. Humans are good at analogy and metaphor, which are making things be alike that aren't alike. AIs are good at satisfaction. Humans are good at delight. AIs are good at answering questions. Humans are good at asking questions. AIs are great at data. Humans are great at taste. We have different abilities. The greatest team, the greatest team at chess or at Go is not an algorithm versus a person. It's a team of an algorithm and a person versus another team of an algorithm and a person. And this is important from a strategic perspective because and this is the big question I want to ask. If humans are good at this, the question is, do you get to do any of these things in your job? Right? Are you using any of the truly human capabilities in what you do? Is your business allowing your human employees to do this? And if the answer is no, then you're in trouble. 
the, the two professions that are at the absolute biggest points of vulnerability for AI in the near future are radiologists and accountants. Right? Both of those deal with highly structured data, highly regularized forms of data. AIs are love highly structured data. If you're creating an AI, the phrase is, there's no data like more data. That's why Watson, although Watson has its problems, was able to start doing extraordinary things with uh, oncology and tumor recognition. Uh, and that is why a lot of accountants are going to be out of business because the most structured data that we have is our financial data. So if you don't get to do this, then you should be paying, you should be really quite worried. And so I'm going to speed through all of this because, frankly, it's too much fun to, to, and I don't have enough time. But, uh, and I did lovely animations, but I want to get to the very end part, which is this, pulling it all together. In two to ten years, everything is connected to everybody and everything by 5G. The whole world is a display medium with the video verse. Self-driving vehicles, commerce becomes geographically agnostic. With 3D printing, consumers become customers and then become co-creators. With AI, we see our human-to-human -human relationships become more important and not less. So the question I want to leave you with is, is your strategy ready? Because if your strategy isn't ready, then you should probably make it ready. And a lot of the people in this room would be delighted to help you with that. Cascade would be delighted to help you with that. I, of course, would also be delighted to help you with that. One of the things that we do is we have the meteor strike threat assessment, where we work with companies to figure out, what are you not seeing? What phenomena, what trends are you not paying attention to? And at the center, I am co-lead this thing called the Actionable Innovation Practice, where we measure your organization's innovation quotient, what we call IQ2, to find out whether or not you've created the innovation biome that your company needs in order to thrive. So if you would like a copy of the slides for the people looking at home, ping me. There's my contact information. The information is going to be in that dongle that Carl gave you, because I know I went through a hell of a lot of stuff very, very quickly. I'm sorry I went a little bit over. If we have time for questions, I'd be delighted. And thank you so much for your attention at the end of the day.